All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. And what I'd like to do is I'm just going to start with a couple quick slides and we can tell you a little bit about Kylo Partners as we're presenting. Uh, we are an exclusive Bullhorn integration partner and we have over 200 clients all over the globe. So we tr truly do have a global footprint for all of you that are international. And we also, in addition to doing customization and implementations, we also offer apps that go beyond Bullhorn's basic capabilities. And we might highlight one or two of those as we go through tips and tricks to show you what Bullhorn might be capable of. And at the end of the day, between implementation, customization, consulting, um, ad hoc training, that's how we help your staffing business or any staffing business get the most out of Bullhorn and push beyond its basic capabilities. And certainly for today, uh, we are going to be going through um, a series of quote unquote tips and tricks uh, associated with Bullhorn. Um, and to do so, you have myself, uh, Principal Director in the Americas, and I was once upon a time a 12 year veteran of Bullhorn. So I've been around the block and I've done a lot of consulting um, with various size clients uh, throughout the years. And the other person we have with us is already introduced is Martin Wishart. He truly is a, what I would call him, the Kylo Plus apps guru. So he knows more about all the add-on functionality that Kylo provides than anyone else on earth. And so you'll be in good hands between the two of us today. So for the agenda, um, we're going to go through what I would consider, you know, some pretty basic things with like leads, um, setting some default values and templates, uh, searching and actioning, um, also very important. You can you know, find out a, some nice details there to make you, yourself more efficient. And then data cleanup. It's, of course, very important to keep your searches useful, to keep your data clean. Um, and then automate, automated documentation. Who, who doesn't need that? Um, that's going to help everyone within your organization. So with that being said, uh, I am going to switch over into Bullhorn. So let me end my slideshow. And, you know, as I start this webinar, um, you know, I, I like to start off as, you know, with a quote. And as Forrest Gump once said, you know, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And I find that when you sign up for a webinar like this where it's tips and tricks, you really have no idea um, you know what you're getting into so this is really no different and uh, we hope that you like the selection of topics we prepared for you today um, you know and, and as we do that I'm going to you know kind of take you through both sales and recruiting touch on both of those and in cases um, this will be you know relative to the version of Bullhorn we're going to be demonstrating out of, which is the Novo Enterprise version. Um, and if anyone isn't on that, they're still on S release or they're not on Enterprise, you know, I'm certainly happy to have a conversation with anyone after the fact um, that wants to, um, you know, know more about Novo or may, uh, weigh the merits of upgrading to Bullhorn's Enterprise Edition. Um, I'm also going to be hopping into the administrative tools in Bullhorn, so I realized not all of you are administrators, but certainly, you know, if you see something you like here that had to do with the administrative tools, you can take that to your administrator and, and have them have a try at it. Um, so I'm going to, you know, try and inject the, the tips and tricks in a logical progression of sales and recruitment. So, you know, in your business, um, you know, there's a cradle to grave type of uh, workflow that starts all the way from the, the high level, uh, you know, sales funnel all the way down to, you know, the, the invoicing and collections. Um, so where I'm going to start is at the very beginning, at the top of the sales funnel with leads. Um, leads is part of Bullhorn's enterprise, uh, enterprise offering. And I find that even a lot of clients that have the enterprise offering don't necessarily leverage leads. So, you know, I've done a lot of consulting over the years and this is one of those areas where I can't stress strongly enough the importance of really having clarity into whether people are following up on leads and, and how that's being tracked in the system and how you're managing it. So the first thing is I'm, you can see I'm in my leads list or I'm in my leads area. Um, and I can toggle back and forth. So a lot of people just come in their leads like this and they have, you know, maybe their, 
their my dashboard um, they they have that up and they have some things there but you know the people that are managing their data in a visual manner and a list manner so you know knowing what to action first a lot of times even if they go into their leads list they'll manage it from the dashboard view um, and the first you know thing is leads by age probably the most important card here um, you want to know how things are falling off and how you know people aren't attending them because there's nothing worse if you're doing it manually that you know the lead ends up in the circular file of the trash can and you just never know what's going on but even once it's logged you still need to make sure that people action on it within this first window of 0 to 15 days if they don't you know it, it might as well have ended up in the circular file um, also when you're putting leads in the system bullhorn has some great mechanisms for doing that one is is this accelerator that they had up there you can highlight data in a web page and you know pull that into bullhorn another which you're probably all familiar with is you know being able to add an email contact or you know you get an email and you can use the bullhorn widget in email to to pull that data in and add them as a lead but one of the ones that I find a lot of companies really want their uh, you know their basically recruiters who are doing references to do is to turn is to turn those references into leads so I'm actually just going to pull up uh, Jonathan Volt who's a candidate that you know we have some references for and I could be doing a reference uh, with say Kevin Ralph here and one of the actions is you know add as a lead so I, I think that you know really making sure that you're getting as much as you can out of references and really pushing people to add a lead um, especially since you can measure it is really important um, so I can go ahead and add a lead here if, if I'm a novo I'm doing it from an action if I'm doing it from s release <clears throat> there's actually a link over here to the right um, that would say add lead so I'm gonna go ahead and add Kevin in and I'm just gonna add in the basic I'm just gonna say qualifying go ahead and save this and so now I have Kevin Kevin in the system he's a lead great and you know if someone's gonna follow up I could have assigned that to someone else or I could do it myself um, but <clears throat> I think as you're adding activity either to a lead or to anything else um, I'm sure many of you are aware of using templates whether those templates are a note template a task template an appointment template you know they're sprinkled throughout the system they're great uh, and I'm just going to use my screen template but they're not very well formatted because um, they, they don't really store the formatting um, so if you have them great um, if you want to do a little bit more with them sometimes people want templates actually in directly in the entities and not just in these you know activity areas um, so an example of what I'm going to show you do one of the tips and tricks is you know if I go into Kevin Ralph and I'm just going to close out of this note real quick. If I go into Kevin's record, you can see here that on the comments section, oh, there's a bunch of content here asking me to fill it out. Because what I've done is I put a template directly into the comments field. So you know, not all not all the data you need in you know, whatever entity you're talking about necessarily needs to be fielded. But you want to collect a lot of color, especially for something like a lead, where you're potentially handing it off to someone else. So. In this case, what I've done is I've put this template in as the default value for this comments. So just to you know, go in quickly to show you the kind of magic behind the scenes, I went in as admin to the field maps, and then I came into the lead. And in this case, I'll just search on comments. And I put that in as a default value. Now, I, I'm going to expand this because you might be saying to yourself, wow, that looks like garbage. <laughs> and it, it does indeed look like garbage because it's HTML. And so the real trick to creating these, these templates where you can see it's different size, uh, different size fonts, you know, I have table structure in there and things like that, is actually doing it in HTML. So when you're in a comments box or a resume field or anything like that, you can design things exactly the way you see fit. And once you have something that looks good, like the template you want, all you need to do is click the source button. Click the source button, copy that, control A, control C, 
and then put it in the default value and then save. And then instant presto, you know, the next time you bring up that entity, whether that's a, a main entity like a lead or a candidate or a custom object that you've added along the way, you can have that template there for you. So I found that that's been really helpful in um, you know, gathering data for a lot of clients and allowing them to structure things in the way they wanted, where they wanted. So the next thing I wanted to uh, go through was switch it was actually pulse so when people are on bullhorn i think that in general they are excited you know about the usability of bullhorn but oftentimes they don't fully they don't fully adopt all the technology that's there and i think that pulse is one of those things so i've actually just switched over in the background to my instance of Bullhorn. So as any good marketplace partner, we actually use Bullhorn as our CRM. And so what I've done is I've gone into a company and I have actually gone into the Pulse tab. So the Pulse tab is really, really great. You know, it's going to allow you to make sense of you know, what's been happening through your email correspondence, whether that's a, a volume thing to see what's going on, who the most responsive contacts are, in this case, Dave Smith, um, you know, or top engaged coworkers, who's been engaged the longest and active with those clients. You know, these are great data points. But the one that I feel is often left behind is flagged emails, mostly because people just don't know where to set the setting uh, to go ahead and start tracking this. So Bullhorn's a little big brotherish about tracking email, which is a good thing. So that way I can come in and I can see, you know, if anything's been positive or negative uh, within this client. And so what I can do is I can pull up my preferences and in my preferences, I scrolled down already, but in my preferences, there's gonna be a pulse trigger words. So you can see upsets here, and you know I have some really negative things, malicious, <laughs> dishonest, but then I also have some great things, like fantastic, great, outstanding. Um, and what's gonna happen is when I go in there and I'm reviewing this client, I can immediately see like what the, the pulse is, if you will, or the temperature of this client. And so I can see upset was triggered in this one. Okay, well I can go in there and you know then I can upset, I can see, okay, Great, here's upset. Just want to assure you that we're not upset with you. Okay, so in my in my case, great. My heart's not beating as fast anymore because it was a false alarm. They're they're not upset with us. But this it's a very relevant, um, you know, to make sure that you can easily understand and you can set these as an individual. So when you look at this, this is your individual flagged emails. So once again, that's a you know really underutilized piece of bullhorn. I would highly recommend that if you can, you're going to go ahead and you know utilize that. So with that, um, you know, I want to introduce the concept of you know contract execution in easy automated fashion. Whether it's you know specific to things like mutual non-disclosure agreements, overarching client agreements, or, or specific placement contracts. Kylo has developed a tool that will save a lot of time and manual effort. And I'm going to pass that off, this, the, I'm gonna pass off the uh, presentation to Martin, and he's gonna walk you through what Kylo calls awesome docs. So hi everyone, and thanks Jason for that, that was great. Um, so I'm actually going to touch on two products here that we've got. So one part of it is Awesome Docs, which is a tool that we've built that sits inside Bullhorn that helps to automate the process for creating documents. And then I'm going to show you how that links into our DocuSign integration. So what I'm going to demonstrate just now is me creating a, a client contract for this temporary placement that I've got here. Now, I'm going to action it from the placement. One thing I just want to point out about the capabilities within Awesome Docs is creating this from the placement does not mean that I'm only limited to getting placement information. We can go and look at all the entities associated with this and pull in information from that. So that would, of course, include all the fields on the placement record, the candidate, the, the company, the client contact, and the job. And that does extend into some custom tabs and custom objects. So we 
we do quite often find that when a client comes to us and looks into Awesome Docs in more detail, we might be able to consolidate four documents that they have that they have to create individually into one using Austin Docs. Um, and the simple process to action this is by selecting the action here in the top right hand corner and choosing Awesome Docs. And when I choose Awesome Docs in the background now, it's finding me all the templates I have built from the placement record, which are essentially your different contracts or document types. You choose the document you want to create at this time, and as soon as I click like this button in the background, we're going to all those relevant entities and fields and pulling the information from Bullhorn and putting it into the document. And we've now got this little cog which I can open up here to choose my output settings. So I just want to point out in here that the two, well, the file types that we support within Awesome Docs, we can create files in a DocX Word format or a PDF. And that will, of course, once you complete, save straight back into the placement record. And I now want to press this create button as my next step. Now, as soon as I press create, this is going to place all the information into the template you've built in the background. And then it's going to open up into Word so we can see it and just ensure it's exactly as we want it to be before we send it off to their client. And just touching upon the placement a little bit, um, the, sorry, the template a little bit, we can actually, we've actually developed a way in which we can build our entire templates in Word, which means that we can use all of Word's functionality within our templates and of course apply lots of branding and styling to it which you can see in this and also you'll notice that I have some words that are highlighted in yellow and within brackets. Now the reason for that is because this template has been password protected and it's highlighting all the information that we've pulled from Bullhorn and the way this is configured is that that is the only part of the document that can be edited without knowing the password. So it's just adding a little bit of additional security into the template, meaning that you know I can make changes to stuff within this within this bracket. But if one if I wanted to actually edit or make any changes to the body of the contract, the actual legal terms within it, I couldn't do that unless I know, knew the password. So just a little bit of extra security there for you. Um, so we remove the tick box here, and I can actually add some manual information down here if I need to. And You've got the full capabilities of Word once you are in here. So you can make any edits or changes you want to, and of course, add some information in. Now, happy with this document, and I want to just um, send this off to my client. So I'm going to hit the Save button in the top left-hand corner, and shutting this down will actually put that straight back into Bullhorn. That's not going to save it locally on your computer. That's going to put it straight back into Bullhorn against this placement record. So that's awesome docs. That's the part of the doc part of the process which is creating the document for you or creating the contract. And now I'm going to show you how this links in with our DocuSign integration. And the simple process now is I want to send this off to my client for signature. And if the DocuSign integration is enabled within a template, I will see this logo here. And all I have to do now at this point is simply press this button. And pressing that button there is going to send this contract out via DocuSign for my client to sign. No need to take it out of Bullhorn or upload it into DocuSign manually, just simply press this button. To give you a little more detail, I guess, on what actually happened there is if I open this little cog here, within the template for the, the client contract, we've predefined or told it who's signing it and where it's signing. So it's going to the client contact, it's then coming back to me as the corporate user to countersign. And then within here, we've got a pre built um, email template that goes with it, which we can, of course, use merge fields within here to pull in some information about who it's going to. So sending it via DocuSign, you simply press this button. If I now go into my email inbox here and acting as my client, this is how they receive it. And this is now just standard DocuSign functionality. Your client receives the document, they open it up and review it. <clears throat> and of course, they are absolutely delighted to receive a contract. So they have a quick scan through, come to the bottom and hit the sign button here adopt and sign the document and finish. And the cool thing here now is that, of course, this is now going to come back to me for counter signature. I'm going to sign and complete the process, but there's still no manual process in place for me. I don't need to download it or re-upload it into Bullhorn because our integration puts that straight back into the placement for you without any manual updating. And as you can see here, I've got a signed contract from DocuSign. And just to prove it, here we are, document there, scroll down to the bottom, and we can see that it's been signed. So that is Awesome Docs um, being utilized with our DocuSign integration. And 
just to know, I've demoed it from the placement record here, but awesome docs can be used from every entity in Bullhorn. So it can be used for your client agreements at the beginning of a recruitment process, as well as your, your placement contracts as well. And I will now pass it back over to Jason, and he will give you some further tips and tricks in Bullhorn. All right. So everyone should be seeing my developer <coughs> open position. And, you know, now I'm going to, I did a couple of tips and tricks on the sales side. So now I'm going to move over to the recruitment side of the house. And, you know, I think that the biggest thing is it's really important that all the users really understand how the candidate search works in a detailed way. So they can get the most out of the search results, you know, each time. If what we find and what I've seen is that, you know, if the recruiters don't really know the kind of bells and whistles um, of the search mechanism, that they end up, you know, going outside of Bullhorn first because they just, they aren't getting the results they want from in Bullhorn, so they go outside, which essentially costs your company money and undermines the, the great data you already have at your fingertips. So I'm just going to bring up the search screen and by that, I mean the candidate list view and I'm going to click search. And, you know, the first thing is I like to mouse over just this, the magnifying glass seems very basic, but I find that almost no one, when I talk to them, really understands what's being searched when you go ahead and put in your keywords, because it's more than just the resume. It's, you know, candidate name, current company, employment preference, current job title, the resume itself and file attachments. And sometimes people get frustrated because they put in keywords and then it's not highlighted when they're you know, reviewing in the, the results screen. Um, and a lot of times that's because the keywords someplace else, right? It's not in the resume. So always important to know that. And if I switch to basic, um, so you know, I can be very much a drag and drop person because that's what I am at heart. Uh, you know, I can only search it, I can click this box, only search a description. All, also something that, that not everyone's aware of, a lot of people are. And as part of that, uh, you know, what I'll say is, is that when you only search a description, it's kind of misleading because what it's actually doing is it's only searching the most current resume that's been parsed out and placed into the description, and that's the name of the, the database field, this is a description field. So really what this means is only search most current resume. Um, Bullhorn does a great job with, you know, parsing out the information for you, um, but it's also important to know where that data is and how to leverage it. So that being said, you know, I think from a standpoint of, you know, adding additional criteria, it's really important to know what's available because there are some additional criteria criteria you can add in down here that are really useful, that most people aren't leveraging. And, you know, there's a lot of people at your organization or a lot of candidates that, you know, have interacted with your organization that, you know, have gone through, down the road with you, but not necessarily, you know, gotten a position or got, you know, been placed. You know, I would use a saying, always a bridesmaid, never, a bridesmaid, never a bride type of thing. <clears throat> well, those bridesmaids are, you know, your best candidates to get out there, people that have, you know, been been up there, been through the process, uh, but not necessarily been placed. And you can do that, that kind of stepping back, you can say, hey, I only want to see, you know, initially people we've uh, placed. So I can say include all with placements. So I can shorten, I can shorten my list real quick initially. And then if I don't get what I want, then maybe I broaden it and say, hey, you know, show me all the people we've actually sent out that we thought were you know, quality people. And, you know, once again, we get to a little bit bigger list, but once again, a very honed list of people we know have been active with us in the past. <clears throat> and then you can go all the way back to submissions. Uh, another item here is no action, just making sure that, you know, there's a lot of things like if you're, you know, if you have screenings that you do or certain type of notes that denote, um, you know, some sort of positive or progressive activity you can filter down people with notes of that type. Um, and you can even do things like, you know, we all know the best candidates are the ones who you source 
that your recruiters source, not necessarily the people that apply. I'm not saying that you know everyone that applies is not awesome, but um, you can also do things like exclude. I can say, you know, show I want to exclude people that applied to us because I know they came in, they weren't they weren't you know proactively uh, you know gotten they weren't proactively um, collected into our database. Um, and then certainly other things like hot lists. That's a big one because a lot of companies use hot lists for um, understanding how many you know, as basically a category tag um, for people that are hot of a certain type of, of business. So make sure that you fully leverage hot lists or tear sheets or whatever your terminology for those are. Um, so that's some additional criteria tips. Just make sure you're fully leveraging all those items when you go through the search process. Now, from configuration standpoint, when I'm going in and I'm selecting a field here, you know, one of the things I'll say is there's, there's a lot here. Right there, there's a lot. In fact, wow, there's custom fields. There's you know all this stuff that's hidden, you know, and you know that's great. You can type in, you can start typing up the top, and it'll kind of par down the list for you. But there's a lot of extra garbage in here that's not being used. So from a, a best practices perspective, you know, I would say that you know I'm going to go back into admin um, and the view layout because there's a few few tips here for that, and I'm going to go into the candidate entity. And in search, you can see that by default, pretty much everything's included in the view. So you can very quickly as an administrator come in and remove items from that view to, to make the clutter less. And once again, increase the, the, can, or the, sorry, the recruiter experience um, to make it easy to use or easier to use. Um, and the other thing while we're here <clears throat> is that fast find. You know, so a lot of people don't know, but you can, especially in S release, this is important because it wasn't there for a long time. You can change what's actually returned in the fast find. So if I do my search for Jonathan Bolt, you know, you can change the fields that are returned here. Um, and I think in Novo, that's going to be personalized, but in S release, um, definitely, definitely worth noting. Uh, that you can change the fast find to make sure you can get the data fast like you want it. So once we get our results set back, and I, I've leveraged all this great new you know criteria, and I run my search, and I get my results set back, now let's talk about actioning. Um, because you know, what are we going to do with all this data? In this case, we have 2,800, and this is a small demonstration database, but you could have, you know, millions, millions of records in your database. Um, but you want to action them. And, you know, maybe it's for, you know, mailing, for mass mailing. And, <clears throat> you know, or maybe it's that time of year and you want to send out some holiday correspondence, whatever the case is. And Bullhorn limits you uh, to a certain amount of mass mails at a time. <clears throat> and certainly it makes it really difficult um, to when you have a large list like this, since you can only send out a small group at a time to really accomplish that in a meaningful way. So the, the tip and trick here is to create a large, large tear sheet. And so I'm going to select all 28, 2,800 people, and I'm going to say I want to add them to a hot list because that's what I've that's what I call a tear sheet in my system. So I'm add, and it's going to say, oh, it can only add 2,000 at a time. Okay, that's fine. I get it. So I'm going to. Enter the name of new tear sheet, Jason's large list. And I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it'll take a second to go ahead. But the thing that not a lot of people know is they see the limit is 2,000. But if you just take that same list again and add it to Jason's large list, then it will just keep adding 2,000 at a time. So if you, if you have, six, say, 6,000 candidates that you want to you know, reach out to, um, in some capacity, or just tag them to a hot list or a tear sheet. You can do so, and I'm going to come up and I'm going to go into my hot lists, and we can see there's my candidate. So it's just about done, and so now I'm back here in my list because it's put all those in. I'm going to select all 2,800 again, and I'm going to say add to hot list, and I'm going to say okay, and we're going to add it to Jason's hot list. So now, when I refresh this, we'll see it's adding more than the 2,000. So it's, you know, granted it's not, you know, super smooth, but it is a trick. 
right? So you can get your tear sheets up much larger, and now we can leverage them. So actions, I can go in and I can click on this, and it will we'll pull up all the candidates that are in there, and then I can mass select, and I can say, hey, the items per page, you know, I want a lot, and then I can select them all, do my do whatever action I need to do, and then I can move on to the next one, so or the next grouping. So the the way the the reason why that's useful is because you have this large list, but you can go page to page, and then take your action. So it's organized because otherwise, if you just have a list in your you know return list here, you can't send emails out to to everyone at the same time. And you don't necessarily know because it's paginated and it kind of loads on demand uh, what's going on there. So just a, a quick, quick way to send out emails every once in a while. I don't recommend sending out you know a crazy amount of emails, but if you have the occasion to do it once in a while, that's a good trick. And the last thing I'll you know hand it off before I hand it back to Martin for one last quick thing is dispositioning. So if I go into back to this developer and I look at a couple of people that are shortlisted, one of the things I find that people don't really do a great job over or, or some of the clients I've spoken with and consulted with, they didn't do a great job out of the box was the disposition of candidates against their uh, jobs. You know, so a lot of times, you know, just people get orphaned, right? Like someone gets placed and all the statuses stay where they were. But what I find, and also if they get denied uh, by a client or by a salesperson or something like that, it's just you know rejected by client or rejected by a salesperson. But what I find is that you know you usually have people usually have a small list, and that, that's it. <clears throat> but what you know best practice is is kind of have a, a separator and then have some dispositions. So if they decline the offer, why they decline it, um, you know if they were cut out because they were no-show or, you know, poor work history is the feedback or disqualified based on driving record. These are some examples of things that people put in there. And if you can get your salespeople or your recruiters that are handling that activity to go in and actually disposition these candidates, it is tremendously helpful on the far side of, you know, all your activity when you take a look at a holistic view of your business and you can see exactly you know what's going on and where some of your you know kind of uh, roadblocks are and where you're where you're falling down with you know some of the candidates you're providing to these clients or to your salespeople and it's also great from an individual management perspective so those are some tips and tricks that I would you know suggest I think that you know we have we've gone through a fair amount of data here or a fair amount of content related to the searching and certainly you know using the proper tools can make a difference but one of the things i will say is that you know the quality of the data is really important as well and kyle realizes this and we came up with a quick and easy tool to use that identifies records that really kind of are useless um, and are cluttering up your system and you know really annoying your recruiters and once again adding to the the recruiters you know oh well you know our database is a big mess you know I get all these return results that aren't any good uh, and we create a tool that you know helps clean that up so I'm going to close the webinar today with Martin showing you how you can easily do this with the Kylo data cleaner and I am going to change presenter to you Martin and off you go yeah so thanks Jason and here we have it. So what you should be able to see in your screen right now is the Kylo Data Cleaner. So Jason's touched upon the searching inside Bullhorn and how you can find candidates and find all the people you need to, to action and, and contact. But what's not really that easy in Bullhorn's standard functionality, I guess, is to do a kind of big search on a negative sense to find people who, you know, maybe don't have phone numbers and emails as a combination or as you can see on the left hand side, we've got a bunch of different filters you can apply here. So do they have skills, comments, file attachments or not file attachments? And we can actually run searches based on based on based on specific note times or when you actually added them to your system. Um, and the data cleaner can be run across either your candidates or your contacts. 
So what I'm going to run here just now is I'm actually just going to filter the search here so that I can find all the candidates that I can't contact. So everyone who has no email or phone number. And at the bottom here, as you can see, I've got a name for a hot list. So I can simply type in here that this is my hot list and I'm going to call it no contact details. And I simply now just press run report. And in the background here, what we're doing is we're searching across our entire Bullhorn database, um, checking every candidate and seeing if they have a phone number and an email address. And if they don't, they're going to come into our report here and they're going to be grouped in this table um, in years. So this table shows the number of records in your Bullhorn systems that meet your cr criteria grouped by years since last activity, note or since they have been added. So this is obviously less than a year. 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 8, 8 plus years. You've never done anything with these ones. And then at the final column over here, this is your total number. So you can see here that we actually got, you know, within the, within the last year, we've added 2,800, but we've they've all got no phone numbers. But on the right-hand column here, what I want is I just want my total. So I want to get everyone out of the database that don't have any contact implement, contactable information. And I can simply select this button here and press OK, and that'll create a hot list. And I know that Jason showed you a little tip in, in Bullhorn there on how you can get around Bullhorn's limit. But by using the data cleaner to find your people and create your hot lists, regardless of whether you find 2,100 candidates or you find 200,000 candidates, you can select all of those and press OK. And that will add all of those to a hot list in one action. So that's another neat little way you can, I guess, get around that scenario and add mass people to, to a big hot list. And that kind of concludes my part on the data cleaner. I'm just going to bring up the slides here because I think we're going to move on to the, the question and answer portion. And I'll pass it back to, to Jason. Okay, so as Martin said, we're going to move right over into the Q&A section. Um, so we got a couple questions in. The first is, when you said lead list, did you mean job leads or candidate leads? Um, so the lead list in Bullhorn, for those of you that aren't aware, is actually a lead entity. It's an actual entity unto itself, and usually it's a precursor to contacts and companies. and and therefore jobs or even opportunities if you're utilizing those uh, downstream. But usually the, the context is usually it's a sales lead where you're trying to convert that person into a, a contact and potential you know, job or opportunity. There are companies, uh, especially you know, like executive search, you know, where it takes a long time to, to vet and create a relationship with the candidate. Sometimes they use leads for candidates as well, but it truly is its own entity that can be you know, progressed to other bullhorn entities. Awesome. Next question. Are there any implementation costs to Awesome Docs? I'll, Martin, I'll, let, you, yeah, I'll let you take that. Yeah, on that. So the short answer is yes, there is implementation costs for Awesome Docs, and it's based on the number of templates that you get us to build. Um, and that could be that could be one, it could be hundreds, but just bear in mind as well that within the, the implementation set of costs, we will provide full training on how you can build and create your own templates within our template builder. And any templates you build would be free. So bear that in mind. So so it sounds like the implementation cost is a fairly minimal cost and you can help control that based on how much work you want to do with the, with the builder versus having Kylo do it. Next question. To fully utilize the Awesome Docs integration with DocuSign, do we need an agreement with them? Um, yeah, you would need a, an agreement with DocuSign. Um, and the only stipulation with the DocuSign is that um, DocuSign would have the API package enabled so that we can create the integration. For Data Cleaner, does the size of our database affect speed? And if so, how? Well, the size of your database does it does affect speed, but there's other variables as well. Um, I guess the size of your database, because we'll have to search across the entire thing, but then also the filters you apply as well. If you have 
zero filters, then it's going to search across the entire database and find a huge number. But if you apply more filters, we're always going to find less less people, so it'll take less time. Yeah, and the color there, I think, is even if it takes a few minutes or you know even ten minutes, if it's an absolutely huge database or something to complete. It's still you know a great avenue to be able to aggregate your data um, as far as the records that that need you know, archiving or removal or action, so. And are your apps able to be used in Novo? Yes, they are. They're all available in Novo now. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. So I think that that's all the questions that we have time for today. Don't want to go over. Um, there were a couple great questions that we're happy to handle offline, so we'll make sure that we follow up with anyone who asks questions. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the time today. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.